right, all right. Good morning, Church of the City. How you doing today? You good? You happy to be here this morning? I am happy that you're here with us. Hey, before we jump into the Word this morning, let me uh, kind of uh, make sure that you are aware, all of the ladies in the house. Let me hear all the ladies. All right. As you know, you did not have a gathering this past Saturday, yesterday, due to the fact that we thought that there was going to be bad weather, and then there wasn't, and it was a joke after it was all said and done. But anyways, this coming Saturday is when your gathering's going to be. So it was moved just one week, so make sure, ladies, if, if you're hearing me and those that are watching online, that you are here next Saturday, 11 to 1. It's going to be a wonderful time of fellowship and uh, hanging out and enjoying each other. And um, food, lots of food. Food. Food's good, right? And uh, best part of all, um, you get to hear Pastor Melissa give a word. Hey, so there you go. So make sure that you're here and you're you're part of that. All right, how many of you ready for the word this morning? All right, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. We have been in the series called The Power of Relationships. Everybody say The Power of Relationships. We've been talking about friendships, we've been talking about relationships, we talked about marriages last week, and uh, we've been hitting on different kinds of relationships, relationships that are important, but relationships that are important to God. Amen. I said it, I've said it every single week that, that your relationships are important to God, and you need to know that. He cares about your relationships, and He wants you to have healthy, good, strong, solid relationships. Amen. Come on, do you believe that with me? All right. So, Nehemiah chapter 4, we're going to read verse 13 and 14, and then we're going to jump down and read 19 and 20, all right? Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13, it says this, So I stationed people behind the lowest sections of the wall at the vulnerable areas. I stationed them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I made an inspection, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the great and awe-inspiring Lord and fight for your countrymen, your sons and daughters, your wives and your homes. All right, now go down to verse 19. We'll read verse 19 and 20. It says this, so then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is enormous and spread out, and we are separated far from one another along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Come on, somebody say that with me. Our God will fight for us. Our God will fight for us. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would teach us something from your word today, God. We thank you, Lord. We receive it now. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. So what we see in this scripture is something that was relevant back to the day of Nehemiah, but is still relevant for us today, and it's this. is if, if, if you put up a fight for your family, then God will put up a fight for you. We see that. We say, he says, fight for your family. Fight for your children. Fight for your sons. Then it goes on down to verse 20. It says, if you fight for them, then it says, now I, the Lord, will fight for you. That's something that's important for us to remember today. So the title of my message, if you're taking notes, is simple. is put up a fight. So, somebody say it with me. Put up a fight. Put up a fight. How many of you believe that God cares about your family? Come on, everybody should, everybody should raise your hand. God cares about your family. God cares about my family. He's concerned about my family. He wants the very best for my family. He cares about my relationship with my wife. He cares about my relationship with my children. He cares about those things. It's, it's his desire to see to it that we have a healthy home, a strong home, good relationships in the home. He cares about that. And he cared so much about it. And in Nehemiah, we know that all of these things were going on and they Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls back up and we see that he's being attacked and we see that people are coming against him and in despite all of those things and even though all of those things are occurring the one thing that God cares about in that moment is his family it says it says fight for your family fight for your sons fight for your daughters this message can go in a million different directions today but right off the bat I want to tell you, 
fathers that are in the house, mothers that are in the house, you better be fighting for your family. This is the time, for real. You better be fighting for your family. Dads, you better be fighting for your kids. Moms, you better be fighting for your kids. Husbands and wives, you better be fighting for your marriage. Come on, how many of you know there's an attack against marriages? And the enemy don't like marriage. There's an attack against marriage. You got to fight for it. You got to fight for your kids. He cares about it. If God cares about your relationships, he certainly cares about your family. And really the attack more than anything in the day and age that we live in today is against the home. It's against family. Because he knows, the enemy knows that if he can come into your home, then he can take just about anything else. That's why he comes into your home. He tries to mess up your relationship with your spouse first. That's why he comes against and causes separation between you and your kids. And he, he loves to do that kind of stuff. And, and I want to tell you today that, that your marriage is worth fighting for. It is. And, and your kids are worth fighting for. And, and your family is worth fighting for. Well, Pastor, I don't like any of my family members. They are all messed up. I don't care about them. They're still worth fighting for. I got family members that I don't even want to be around. I get it, all right? We all have that. And I got some that I want to be with all the time. There's some people that I'm like, man, if they just keep their distance, I am happy. Let's just leave it that way. But that doesn't mean that I don't love them. That doesn't mean that I don't fight for that, amen? Because at the end of the day, they're still family, right? And God has put together a family unit. Whether you like your family or not, you like the home that you're in or not, if you're a young person in this place and you think that your parents are the worst ever and you don't like it, it don't matter. God has put together your family. And you ought to honor your family. You ought to love your family. You ought to respect your family. So let me say it this way. If you don't take a stand for your kids, and if you don't take a stand for your family, then who will? Someone will take that stand. Someone will step in there, and you don't want it to not be you. You want to fight for your family. Reality is, though, you've got to win the war at home before you can ever win the war outside the home. There's plenty of war that's going on outside the home, but if you can't get the home right, and everything else is going to be messed up and corrupted. You have got to get your home straight. You have got to win the war at home before you win the war anywhere else. Dads, husbands in here, before you win the war at your workplace, you better be winning the war at home. Your priority is your wife and your children and your family. It is not your job and your career. Because you can lose that sucker tomorrow morning. The one thing that you cannot afford to lose is your marriage and your kids. Come on, can I get an amen? Now, Pastor, you're being tough already. I know. I want to be. So Nehemiah was encountering the enemy time to time again. He, one thing after another was taking place. And he, he finally got to the point where he was done dealing with the enemy. Come on. Has anybody else ever been there? You just, you just flat out done tired dealing with the enemy, right? And, and he finally gets to that point where he's just done. Enough is enough. Enough attacks, right? He's like, I'm going to take a stand now, right? And he knows that God is going to fight for him. And listen to me, church. At, at some point in your family, at some point with your kids, at some point with your marriage, you have got to take a stand against the enemy and put up a fight. Because the fight is always going to be there. The enemy is always going to be attacking. And, and it's up to you to put up a fight against the schemes of the enemy, I don't know about you, but I, I have, I've faced many different challenges where I have recognized the fact that the enemy was trying to creep into my home. And if I didn't put a stop to it right then and there, then no telling what could have taken place thereafter. You have got to put up a fight against the enemy in your home. If there is a bunch of strife and division in your home, you better get it right. You just better get it right. And it's your responsibility. It's not anybody else. It's not, a, it's not a counselor. It's not someone who can come into your home and, and help you rearrange everything and figure it out. It is up to you. You have got to want to be the one that puts up a fight, and you got to be the one that takes a stand. Amen? So turn to your neighbor and say, put up a fight. Come on, tell them with some boldness. Look at someone else and say, put up a fight. There are two things that I believe are, are crucial for each person. Two things I believe are crucial for each person. One is you must be committed to God. We know that. We know that. You must be committed to God. 
But number two is that you must be committed to your family. This is crucial for your health. This is crucial for your well-being. It's crucial for your physical body, for your emotional health, for your physical health, all of those kind of things, spiritual, everything, is that you are committed to God, number one, but number two, that you're committed to your family. And we have seen, I talked a little bit about it last week, I talked a little bit about, I hit on priorities for just a second, but we see that priorities get out of whack all the time. That, that, that people would rather put their job over their family. Priorities messed up. That people sometimes, hear me, I, do, I say this in love because I mean it in love. You put your kids over your wife. Priorities. Priorities are messed up. We got to be careful with our priorities. What we prioritize most is what we're going to give most of our attention to. What you prioritize most is what you're going to give the most attention to. And so if you put some things in place, if you prioritize some things over things that matter more, your attention and your focus is going to be on it and not on the things that really matter most. We have got to be careful in that way. So I'll say it this way. No weapon formed against the family that is built upon the rock shall prosper. We know that the word says no weapon formed against me shall prosper, but I believe that we can start declaring over our homes and over our families that no weapon against the family, no weapon against my family, no weapon against my marriage, no weapon against my kids shall prosper because it is built upon the rock that is Jesus and it is a firm foundation. Amen. Come on, somebody say amen. It is a firm foundation and you have got to put your family first because it's important in that order, but you have got to make sure that you are committed to the Lord above everything else. And if you can be committed to the Lord as a family, then your home will be built on a solid, strong, firm foundation. Everybody say amen. Listen, I, I know it's not easy to raise kids in today's society. I get it, right? I get it. I know it's difficult. They hear all kinds of stuff, right? They, hear, they say all kinds of things, okay? And things happen. Things, things are crazy all the time. Our kids come home and they say some of the wildest things sometimes. And, and it's crazy. Our daughter came home this week and said, Mommy, is, is B-I-T-C-H a bad word? And Melissa said, in Jesus' name, you know, where'd you hear that, you know, right? And uh, she goes, well, well, my friend at, at school said it was a bad word, so I wanted to ask you. Well, yes, it's a bad word. You hear the craziest things. Kids will come up to you and tell you the most bizarre things, right? And it's hard to raise children in the society and the world and the culture that we live in today. It really is. But it's also possible at the same time. We can have healthy, strong children and we can have healthy, strong relationships with our children. We can build up relationships and a foundation in the Lord if your home is built upon the rock that when they come and they're a part of the home that they're not going to waver to the left or to the right, but they're going to stay centered and focused on the Father. Listen, as parents, if you stay centered and focused and committed to Him, your children will also. They're going to follow what they see. So if all they see is arguing and fighting and anger and all of that, you better believe that that's the way that they're going to see their relationship with you as well. One day they're going to start yelling at you and cussing you out and treating you bad. Why? Because they saw mom and dad do it. So to them, it's okay. But if your house is built on a firm foundation, if your house is built upon the rock and you put Jesus first and you keep him at the center of your home, then listen, he'll be at the center of your kids' hearts. He will be. He'll be at the center of your kids' hearts. When we decide, well, anyways, I'll skip that. So let's jump into the main meat of the, of, of the message today. There's, there's three things that, I want to teach you today, and today specifically I want to talk about children and our relationship with our children. And I'll say it the way I did last week. Last week I talked about marriage, and those that aren't married, I told you don't check out. Don't check out, because you might be married one day. Even though you say you're not going to, you never know. And I say this to you about today, whether you've raised kids and they're done out the house or whatever, or you're not even married, not even thinking about children yet, you need to think about this. You need to think about kids, all right? Because one day, the Lord is going to bless you with children. If you want it, if you desire children, he's going to bless you with children. It's going to happen. So there are three things that we must do for our children. These things are really important, okay? Let me just kind of let you know right off the bat, I am not the best parent in the world. I'm not. 
Admit to that. I'm not the best father. I make mistakes all the time. I do. I make mistakes. But I have learned some things over the last, now Gabriel's eight, eight years old, about to be nine. I have learned over the last eight years a lot of lessons, right? Those that have kids, you learn. Every day is a new lesson, right? You know, you hear things, you see things, you experience things, and it's a lesson to be learned every single day in the home. There's all kinds of lessons that are taking place. So I don't know it all, but I do know a few things. And if you can help me out with these few things that I do know, I promise you it will change your home forever. Amen? So the number one, is, number one is this, three things we must do for our children. Number one is we must spend time with our children. This is so important. We got to spend time with them. If you don't spend time with them, you're doing it all wrong. You have got to spend time with your kiddos. They are important. They are not a burden. They are not just someone extra that is filling up space. They are not just extra money on a tax return, okay? (laughs) They are your children. God has blessed you with them. Some of you are like, yes, they are. That's horrible. Don't do that. They are your children. God has blessed you with them, right? And, and, and he's blessed you with them, and, and so therefore you must do everything that you got to do to raise them up the right way. But you got to spend time with your kids. And listen, time may be only a number to you, but truth is, time flies by quicker than we can ever keep up with. <laughs> Especially when you start getting married and having kids and working on a career and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it just... It goes by so fast. I mean, it was just yesterday when Gabriel was born. I mean, it was literally yesterday. And here we are, eight years later. Like, what the heck? Where did the last eight years go? I don't remember everything that's taken place the last eight years. It has been a breeze. Before you know it, it's going to be another eight years and another eight years. We're going to be empty nesters and we're going to say, what the heck happened? Right? It's, time goes by so quickly. So if time goes by quickly... Let's cherish and nurture the time that we have well. And let's do it in excellence. Let's do it in grace. Let's do it in love. Melissa and I, we have this thing. We observe this all the time. We go to a restaurant. And we see parents and kids spending more time on their phones at dinner than they do with their their moms and dads and with each other. I mean, everybody. I mean, we see it all the time. The table next to us. Every single person at the table is like this. Not a one of them is talking to each other. The only time anybody's ever said something is when they told the waitress what they wanted. And everybody is just sitting there on their phones doing their thing. It even happens maybe in your own home, not at the restaurant where everybody is just focused on their phones or focused on what they got going on. Or maybe the TV is playing in the living room and it's your favorite sports, you know, whatever, and you're watching that and you're not paying attention to what's taking place at the dinner table. Listen, the dinner table is important. You ought to prioritize the dinner table. Make the dinner table important. The people that have abandoned the dinner table, they, they will tell you right now, I promise you, those people will tell you right now that they don't have much of a relationship with their kids. You just grab your plate, go in the other room and sit down and watch TV, and your kids go and do something else. That is not the way it's supposed to be. Well, pastor, there's nothing wrong with it. That may be what you think right now, but wait until they're older and they start telling you about how you never cared about them and about how you never wanted to sit with them at dinner, that you never gave them time, that you never gave them space, that you never listened to them. Just wait. If you think it's okay now, you just wait. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm telling you the truth. I have seen families crumble apart and it all goes back to foundational things like what did you do with the table? Did you prioritize the table? Did you prioritize family time? This is important things. Well, this is not something for Sunday morning. Okay, well then, I don't know what to tell you. But it is. Because if you can't get your home right, you ain't going to get anything else right. You got to get your home right. You have to prioritize the table. And Gia's favorite thing every night is to, is to set the table. She loves setting the table. It's her little job. She does it, right? She goes and sets the table. And every time she goes gets these little sticky notes out of, the, out of the desk, and she writes everybody's name. And every night, all four of us have a different seat. Wait a spot. If she's mad at daddy, she ain't sitting by daddy, right? 
It, it, she'll write down everybody's names and she'll go and she'll put it on the spot that she wants everybody to sit in that night. Sometimes we're all apart at the dinner table. Sometimes we're together. Sometimes she's right next to dad. Sometimes she's right next to mom. Sometimes she doesn't like mom and dad and so she's going to sit by Gabriel. You know, whatever. It doesn't matter. But she sets the table. And, and it's important to us that we congregate and gather at the table. And at the table, there's no phones allowed. There's nothing else allowed is we're sitting there and we're eating as a family. And once everybody is done, then you can get up and go. Not when you scruff yourself, all the food down your mouth, and then you go throw away your plate or whatever and go do what you want. No, no, we don't play that game. Uh Uh-uh. You sit there and you stay at the table until everybody's done. Because there are connections and there are conversations and there are important things that take place at the table. It's important. All the kids that are in here and all the teenagers that are in here, you're hating me right now. You can't stand me right now because you don't want to do this. You don't want to sit at the table. You just want to go do your own thing. You want to play Xbox or whatever, a PlayStation, while you eat your burger. I get it. I get it. But you got to prioritize certain things and... Really, how sad has society become? How sad is it when you can go to a restaurant and everybody's on their phone instead of talking to each other? We've allowed that over time. And here we are sitting back, scratching our heads, what what the heck has happened to my own family? It's because we've allowed all these things. Foundational, core pieces of what a, a family and a relationships in a family look like. We've abandoned those things because we've become okay with it. By no means am I a homebody, but I love spending time with my family. I don't like staying at home. I don't like just chilling at home. I'm not a chill at home guy. I'm not I'm not the type of guy that's gonna go home today and take a nap. Okay? I'm not that type. I don't do that. Okay? But I love spending time with my family. I do. I love spending time with them. And we have got to learn to make our time with our family a priority because here's the facts if you don't spend time with them they'll go spend time with someone else little girl will go find a boyfriend and before you know it she'll get to the age that she could start leaving the house and go and hanging out with the boyfriend because she would rather hang out with boyfriend than she would with you because you've given up on that relationship you don't put enough time and investment into that relationship so she would rather go somewhere else and spend time with somebody else than she would her own mommy and daddy and we got a problem and then you come to church and you're like god I, I need you to help my family no he don't need to do nothing you need to figure it out You need to get it right. You need to get it straight. You got to buckle down and say, no, no, this is what we're doing from now on. I know you ain't going to like me for it, but this is what we're going to do. And because I love you, this is how we're operating in this house. That's the way we're going to have to get, church. Some kids would rather spend time with people they've never met before on a video game than they do with their own family. (laughs) <laughs> they'll, go, they'll go into their room and chat with people all across the world, and they'd rather do that than sit at the dinner table with you. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Am I, am I being too harsh today? I, I hope not. Because here's the thing. We've become okay with sacrificing quality, relational time together for substitutes. We've become okay with sacrificing that, with sacrificing solid, good relational time together for something else, another substitute. And over time, we've just allowed it. We've been okay with it. We allowed it some more, been okay with it some more. And now we have division in the home. We have separation in the home. We have have strife in the home. There's no unity in the home. There's always fighting, all of these things, because we've allowed the small things. The Bible says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the small things like spending time at the dinner table. It's those small things that over time will add up and turn into something much bigger. Parents, hear me for a moment. Nothing, nothing is more important than your time with your kids. Whether they verbalize it or not, they need you. They need you. I don't care if they don't ever tell you that. At the end of the day, they need you. They need mom and dad. They need it. It's important. So listen, make it a priority to eat together around the table at night. Make it a priority to say goodnight and that I love you at bedtime. Well, I'm a teenager. I don't want to hear that from my mom. Okay, don't say it back, whatever. But mom, make sure you say it every night. 
Every night, tell those kids that you love them. Every night, say goodnight. Don't just let your kids go into the bedroom and, and shut the door and do their thing and not say goodnight to them. That's stupid. Don't do that. Say goodnight. Say, I love you. Okay? Even if they're walking out and slamming the door, whatever, you know, I don't know. But, but just at least make sure you express that. Don't ever, if you, if you got little kids, I'm not talking about high schoolers, okay? If you got little kids, make sure you take them into their room. That's important. Like, just walking them into the room is so, so important. Put them in bed. Tuck them in. Every night we pray for our kids. Every night. We don't sacrifice that for not one thing. And nights that I'm not home, say I'm up here or I'm doing something, my kids will literally, they know that when daddy gets home, I'm going to come in there, I'm going to wake them up, and I'm going to pray for them and tell them I love them and good night and I'll see you in the morning. I don't care if they're sound asleep. And they don't care either because they expect it and they love it and they want it. But every night we make it a priority that we're going to put our kids to bed and we're going to tuck them in and we're going to tell them that we love them and we pray over them every single night. It's important. So even if they get to older age and they're not going to want you to kiss all over them and do all that stuff or whatever, man, just go stand outside their door and say, Lord, protect them tonight as they rest. I mean, I don't care what you got to do, but make sure that you make that a priority, that you extend your love at night and that you pray for them. All of those things are important. Listen, all of these things matter. Come on, say it with me. All of these things matter. Thank you. Some of y'all didn't say it because you don't think it matters, but it matters. All right, three things we must do for our children. Number one, spend time with our children. Number two is this. I'm going to have some people that really don't like this, but you're going to have to get over it because I love you. Number two, we've got to discipline our children. We've got to discipline our children. Well, I have read books that we aren't supposed to discipline them. Well, that book wasn't the Bible, sister. I'm just saying, listen, whether you do it or not, believe in it or not, discipline is important to God. Can I get an amen? Amen. Discipline is important to God. So if it's important to him, it needs to be important to us, right? And here's the truth about discipline. Discipline is correction wrapped up in love. That's what discipline is. Discipline is correction wrapped up in love. If you love them, you're going to correct them, period. If you really love your kids, you're going to correct your kids. And not like, hey, Gabriel, we don't do that. No, no, no. Like, it's a little bit more than that sometimes, folks. It's I'm going to go get the belt, or I'm going to go get the spoon or the paddle, and because of your choices that you made just now, you're getting a spanking, right? My kids, my kids get spankings. They get, thank you. They get spanked, they get spanked all the time, okay? Not like every day or whatever, but they get spanked all the time. And they know that that is how we correct them. They know it. They know that's how they, how we correct them. But at the end of the day, they know that we love them. They're not sitting there like, oh my God, all the time, okay? Like, it's not that. But we, we discipline them because we love them. I, I want to read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 through 6, if you'll put it on the screen for me. Go ahead and throw it up there. Hebrews chapter five, uh, excuse me, 12, 5 through 6 says, And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or faint when you are, re- when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son, not some of them, not just some of the kids, every son. This is the Lord that does. And listen, then he says to us later on, like, and he talks about in many places throughout the word that we are to discipline our kids. And discipline is not this. No, no. That is not discipline. I'm just letting you know right now. I'm just trying to help you. Okay? Hear me, church. Discipline isn't something you do to your children. Discipline is something you do for your children. You don't do it to them. You do it for them. Okay? Now let's throw up Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15. This is the one that everybody's been thinking about this whole time, right? A rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a youth left to himself is a disgrace to his mother. When the wicked increase, 
rebellion increases, but the righteous will see their downfall. Discipline your son, and he will give you comfort. He will also give you delight. Who gives you comfort and delight? Your son. But it's going to come if you do what? Discipline. Discipline. It's important. Now, I'm not saying for those that have teenagers in the house to start pulling down the pants of a teenager and spanking them. Okay, at some point, that's no longer a thing, all right? We need to know that. Like, at, at some point, you don't lay your hands on your older kids, okay? That, it just doesn't get that way. Now, I've seen, I've, I've seen it before, all right? I'm not saying it's a, that you absolutely shouldn't or you can't, but I'm just saying be careful, all right? Be careful because, you know, they get on there and tell everybody in the world, <laughs> you know, and it, you can have a big mess in your house real quick. But, you know, when, you, when they are young, you discipline them, and you use the rod of correction. That's what the Bible says, you use the rod of correction. And if you don't use the rod of correction, you need to start using the rod of correction, okay? And again, you do it because you love them. You love them. Here, here are a few things to keep in mind when it comes to discipline. One is discipline with the expectation of obedience. So you discipline with the expectation of obedience, I am correcting you because I am expecting that out of this correction, you are going to be obedient, right? You're going to operate in a spirit of obedience because I am doing this, right? The second thing is, is never discipline in anger. I know that is hard right there. I've been there, okay? We've been in the grocery store and they're messing with everything. You just want to, you know, I get it. I get it, all right? I get it. But don't ever discipline in anger. If you have anger rise up in your heart and it's a discipline moment, take a step back. Say, you know, if I have, dis- if I have anger in my heart, Melissa, you go take care of this right now. You know, whatever. I don't know. You, or, or take a break or, or, or send them off or something and get, come back to it later. Whatever you got to do. But don't ever discipline in anger, okay? Because we don't discipline because we're angry. We discipline because we love, okay? Those, are, those two things don't, don't work together very well, okay? And if you discipline in anger, come on, that's all they're going to know. That's all they're going to know. They're going to say, my daddy beats me because when he gets mad to me, at me. No, no, he doesn't beat you. He's not, no, 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 we, we got to be careful. We don't know what they're going and telling their friends at school or whatever it may be, okay? Hello, I'm, I'm being serious here, all right? We, we've heard some crazy stories. You just, you just never know. But, but for real, you have got to discipline in love. Never discipline in anger. Never discipline in anger, okay? I heard this one time, and it completely changed everything for us. Sometimes we slip, but it's okay. But I heard it said once that, that parents should never discipline with their hands. You always discipline with some sort of, as we read, rod of correction, no matter what it is. Why is that? Because if you, if you discipline your kid with your hand, and then they fall down later, and they need mommy and daddy to pick them up and hold them and love them. The same hand you're disciplined with is the same hand you're comforting them with. And it's confusion to the child. You should never discipline with the same hand that you love. That's why it's so important that you use the rod of correction. Because the rod is for correcting. The hand is for loving. The hand is for loving. So if you've messed up as a parent with that, it's okay. Just repent and say, you know what? I'm going to start using uh, some sort of something, whatever that is that it looks like in your home, okay? And and that's the path I'm going to go because I don't want my loving hands to be misrepresented, okay? Keep that in mind. I know, again, back to the grocery store scenario. I know sometimes you you don't have wooden spoon around the corner. I get it. I know that you can't just whip out the belt and target Okay, I get it, all right? I get that. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you don't, you don't go crazy with your hand or something. But I get it. There are times when in just a quick moment you got to, I get it. I get it. We've slipped up before. And we slip up all the time. But we have to remind ourselves that our hands are for loving. The rod is for correcting. Amen? Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. The third thing was is discipline promptly but reconcile promptly. Discipline promptly, 
but reconcile promptly, okay? We're going to discipline quickly. We're not going to wait. We're not going to say, you know, later on tonight, you're going to get your spankings. No. And it's not this number of, well, when dad gets home. No. That's dumb. Don't do that stuff. If you need to discipline them, discipline them. Don't wait. Because the longer you wait, they know they're getting, they're getting away with it. <laughs> And they know you're forgetting it, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? I remember when I was little, I used to be acting like a fool. And my mom would say, when your dad gets home, you're getting a, you're getting a spanking, da, 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 right? And I think, man, I've got a couple hours. Let me just go do what I want to do. And I sure did. But, of course, when dad got home, I did get it. But I didn't think about that all, the rest, all that extra time that I had to spare when I could still be acting like a fool, okay? When you discipline, discipline promptly, but all you, also you reconcile promptly. We spank our kids or we get onto our kids, we correct our kids, we'll send them into the bedroom, we'll ground them, whatever, you know, whatever it is for that particular thing. And we always go to them as quickly as we can. Gabriel, do you understand why you got a spanking? Do you know why we had to do that? We love you. And we don't want you to make those mistakes anymore. We don't want you to do that thing. We don't want you to say that, you know, whatever it may be. And we love on them. We always love on them, and it's important that you do that. Sometimes they don't want to hear it. Sometimes they're going to bury their head in their pillow and say, leave me alone, you know, whatever. Okay, we get that too. It happens. But at some point, there has to be some reconciliation that takes place, and they have to be reassured that you love them. And the reason why you did that is because you do love them. Come on, can I get an amen in here? Amen. So if you love them, you'll discipline them. I'm going to leave it at that. All right, the third thing is this. Number one, we spend time with our children. Number two, we need to discipline our children. And number three is this, we need to lead our children. This is the most important one right here. We have got to lead our children. I want to ask you right off the bat, are you leading your children or are your children leading you? Are you leading your children or are your children leading you? Are you leading your home, dad, mom? Or are your kids running all over you? Are your kids in control? Are your kids running the house? That's a tough thing for some of us. I get it. But you better be leading your home. Husbands, you lead your home. And if there's not a daddy in the home or not a spouse in the home, mama, you better be stepping up and leading your home. You don't let your kids run all over you. Come on. That's, that's just recipe for disaster later on. I promise you. I promise you, it is. You have got to lead your home. I want to read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 through 9. It says this. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand, and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. This is talking about the Lord right here. Talking about the things of the Lord, the truth, the word, the foundational thing, all of those things, man. You got to bind them together. You got to make it clear. You got to show them, and you got to lead them in the ways of the Lord. If you're not leading them in the ways of the Lord, then where, what are you leading them in? Where are you leading them? If you can't lead them in the things of God, then I, I don't know where they're at. Where, where are they going? You don't know where they're at, where they're going. You've got to lead them in the ways of the Lord. That's so, so, so important to us. If you want your children to grow up loving Jesus, come on, everybody, all of us want that, right? You want your children to grow up loving Jesus, not, not wanting anything to do with him or not wanting to go to church or despising all of those things. You don't want that. You want them to love the Lord with all their heart. You want them to love going to church. You want them to get involved in church. We were talking about this the other day in our house. We were talking about it. We said, Gia, you know what you should do when you get older? You should work for the church. And she's like, yeah, I want to work for the church. You know, she starts talking about it or whatever. We're imparting those things into them at a young age. We're not going to force anything like that. 
if they don't want to be pastors or, you know, whatever involved, oh, that's fine, okay? I, I get it. They don't have to be. They can be what God's called them to be and what they want to be. I get it, okay? But at the same time, we're going to train them up. We're going to train them up in the ways of the Lord. We are going to lead them. There, there's never going to be a time in our house when they say, I don't want to go to church. No, because church is an amazing place to go. It's the best place. It's the most exciting part of your week to come to church. That's the way we treat it. It's the best day of the week. We get to wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning to get to the church around 8, 830, just like a school day. It's great, but it's the best day of the week. It's the best day of the week in our house. Get up, the kids get excited. The night before, they pick out their clothes, what they're going to wear. It's a big deal. Gia picks out the dress that she wants, okay? It's a big deal on Saturday nights getting ready for Sunday morning in our house because we love to go to church. They say, well, that's easy for you because you're the pastor and that's your family. And I, No, like that's the way it's always been for us. Oh, even when they were young and we weren't in charge, like, and we were serving at another church, like church was the day, right? And so that's the way it needs to be in your house. Like you want them to love Jesus. You want them to love the church. You want them to grow up seeing you serve the church, serve the kingdom of God. Those things are important, okay? Th those things are really, really important. They, they don't need to see mom and dad just come and sit and feel real good on Sunday and then walk out the door and never do anything at the church. No, because then they're not going to want anything to do with the church either. You ought to be serving the church. Show them how you serve the church. Be a, go, go be a greeter at the front door and let your little kids see, see you greeting people and loving on people and shaking hands and all that. Because when they get older, they're going to want that too. I promise you. I promise you. Listen, if you don't train them up in the Lord, then someone else will train them up in the world. If you don't train them up in the Lord, then someone else will train them up in the world. We're, we're not going to allow hell to raise our children. Come on, can I get an amen, a loud amen for that? We're not going to allow hell to raise our children. We're, we're not going to allow games and entertainment and Hollywood and all of that to raise our children. Come on, can I get an amen? We need to raise our children. We need to. It's important. It's so important. One more scripture. Stand to your feet with me. One more scripture, Proverbs 22, verse 6. We all know it. Teach a youth about the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Teach them now. So when they get older, they won't depart from it. Amen? It's so important. You have got to lead your children. You want to know, dads? You want to know, moms? You want to know how to leave the greatest legacy of all time that you could ever leave? Prioritize the Lord above all. Prioritize the Lord in your home above everything else. And you will leave a beautiful legacy. That's what it's all about. That's exactly what it's all about. So I'll say it this way, and I'll end with this. Where the mom goes... Where the dad goes, the kids will follow. If you're going in the direction of the Lord, you're leading in the way of the Lord, the kids will follow. If you're loving the church and you're serving the church, you're doing things for the kingdom of God, your kids will follow. No questions asked. You won't have to beg them. They'll just follow. They'll say, they'll say, Dad, I want to I wanna be on the worship team. I want to play the drums on the worship team. That's Gabriel saying. He wants to play the drums on the worship team so bad. I'm going to play the drums on the worship team. Okay. Your time is coming, buddy. Just keep on going. You'll get there. Don't worry. You'll get there. All right. That's how daddy started. Daddy started on the worship, the youth band, playing the drums. Then I started playing for the church. And now look, now, now we're pastoring a church. They're just starting the small things and you'll, you'll get there. You'll get there. Right. And he wants that so bad. Gia wants to sing so bad up here. She just wants to stand right here. She just wants to sing. She wants to lead everybody in worship. She wants to do it. She wants to be just like her mama. 
and lead everybody in worship. She wants to do it so bad. And that time will come. But we're teaching them to love it. And it's not just here in this building. It's all the time. Those that come to our house often, you know, you walk in the house, majority of the time, worship music's playing in the home. Always. It's important. When we get in our car, it's not like, let's just listen to whatever radio station or whatever this or whatever that. It's worship music. And if we don't have worship music playing, the kids are like, hello, somebody turn on the Battle Belongs, you know, whatever. And, you know, and they, they'll let us know. They'll let us know that there ain't nothing playing and we ain't worshiping. We need to be worshiping. And they sit back there in the back seat and they say all of the wrong words. All the wrong words. It's great. They sit there in the back seat and they're just out loud as, you know, and we look at each other. We're like, oh, my God. They're not, they have no idea what they're even saying right now. It's not even the song at all. It's great. But they're worshiping. It don't matter. I don't turn around and be like, that's the wrong word. You can't say that. If you can't sing it right, don't sing it at all. You know, like, I'm not doing that number. But they're worshiping. They're worshiping. Now, if you're an adult and you're sitting next to me in the passenger seat and you're singing it all wrong, man, I'm going to turn that radio off real quick because that's just straight up annoying and frustrating. Don't be coming into my car and going, no. If you're going to sing it, sing it. Okay? I love y'all. All right. I got to get done with this thing. I am done. But I love you. And I love your families. I love your marriages. I love your children. All of these things are important. I wanted to end this series with this way because it really is an important thing. Whether or not you have children or not, that's really irrelevant today. It's still at the core of it is about relationships. Relationships. God cares about those relationships. God cares about your children. Listen to me. God cares about your future children. The ones that aren't even a thought yet. The ones that aren't even in existence yet. He cares about them so much. And he cares about your relationship with your kids. He wants it to be healthy. He wants it to be strong. He wants it to be good. Some people in this room, you got little, little babies. Some people, you got big babies. <laughs> okay. You got bigger babies that are taller than you now. <laughs> okay. Relationships are constantly changing. They're constantly shifting. They're constantly moving. All of these things. But your relationships are important. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'm going to pray over your families. So just receive it. Just lift your hands all across the room. It don't matter if you got kids or not, if you're married or not. Again, those things are irrelevant today. None of those things matter right now. I'm speaking blessings over you. I'm speaking blessings over your family right now. Your future family, future generations to come. The legacy that you will li leave. Come on, some of you got nieces and nephews that look up to you, and that's just as important. Come on, you're leaving a legacy in their life as well. Hallelujah. So right now, Father, I bless each and every person in Jesus' name. I bless them right now, Lord. I bless, Lord, their families right now. I bless their children right now, Father. I thank you, Lord, that you are raising up dads and moms in here, fathers and husbands and mothers, uh, hallelujah, and wives to, to, to be led by you, to listen to your voice, Father God. And you are raising up a group of people that are going to lead their families in the ways of the Lord. And they're not going to depart from it. They're not going to sway to the left or the right. But, Lord, they're going to do exactly what you have called them to do, Father. We thank you, Father God, that you are going to bless their homes in Jesus' name. We thank you that their kids are going to grow up loving their moms and dads. We thank you, Lord, that they're going to grow up loving you, Jesus, first and foremost, above everything else. That they're going to love the church. They're going to love serving Jesus. They're going to want to do things for the kingdom of God. We decree and we declare that right now in Jesus' name. We declare those that may be on their own path, those children that have slipped away or those that have veered off the path a little bit, we call them back right now in Jesus' name. Not only do you care about our children, but you care about our prodigal sons and daughters. And we thank you, Lord, that they're returning back to you right now in Jesus' name. We thank you that we're going to be examples. We thank you, God, 
Lord, that you're going to use us, Father God, in a mighty way in our homes. If we're lacking, God, help us. If we're weak, God, help us. Your word says for where we, we are weak, you are strong. So, Lord, help us to be strong in areas that we're weak. If we're, if we're a dad in here, a husband here, if we're not leading our homes the right way, God, get a hold of us right now. We repent for it. Lord, we turn from our old ways of doing things, and we just ask, God, that you would help us to lead our homes the right way. The same goes for mamas in this place, too. You would help us to lead our homes in the right way. We're going to love our kids. We're going to nurture our children. When they're hurt, we're going to pick them up and help them. When they make a bad mistake or they do something they shouldn't, we're going to correct them, but we're going to do it in love. I thank you for it, Father. So, Lord, help our homes, God. Just thank you for everything you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I speak blessings over your homes. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope the Lord spoke to you through today's message. If you have any prayer need or praise reports, please send us an email at cotcdfw at gmail.com. Please like and share this message so we can reach as many people as possible. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you soon.